Melody Ward of the Minnesota Council of Churches. And she, they have, she's our contact for now. Yes. Uh, as our co-sponsor, the people do the computing games <laughs> for us. <I> try. Yeah, I would love to meet everybody. Yeah, I would love that. I wish that I was, uh, I couldn't believe it when I got the email that the family's travel had been deleted. I was so disappointed. Yeah, and we had quite a few actually uh, incidences of travel deletion this week. I wonder if there's, Kenya has been saying they're going to be closing their camps and they've been, they've been saying that for years, but they've actually taken some extra steps to move forward with the paperwork of closing camps. So I'm wondering if there's been a hiccup somewhere. Uh, all the families who, whose travel was deleted are in uh, the dog camp in Kenya, and so I'm wondering if there's been a hiccup somewhere where paperwork has been misplaced or teeth weren't crossed and I dotted appropriately, um, which typically we see families come back through in another three to six months, but that's another three to six months of waiting and waiting and waiting. <laughs> So yes, uh, I, Don was so so gracious in, in reminding me to be compassionate for the family as well. Because I was like, oh no, the team, the team. And he said, oh, I just went back to his family. And I, I really appreciate that. I value that response so much. That's how everyone responds. <laughs> it's wonderful. Thank you guys so much for that. So I, I I really want you all to have as good of a, uh, uh, a good a time doing this. As possible, um, it's a very difficult task. At the end, I have no doubt that you all all will say, "I, you know, you said it was hard, but I have no idea how hard." And it really is. I, I can't even adequately communicate how difficult it is to be resettled, to be a refugee, to have all this trauma baggage you're bringing with you, and then all sorts of other gaps. Uh, in your life, not having had the opportunity to develop the skills necessary for maintaining a job. You, if you've never had the chance to show up somewhere on time, clock in, stay all day, be tired, clock out, go home, enjoy your family, do whatever you got to do at home, be exhausted when you go to bed, be back up the next day and do it again, that's hard to jump into if you're like 50. <laughs> and it's the first time you're really having to do it in this type of setting. Um, so today we're going to go through kind of um, step by step the co-sponsorship, and we're going to talk about uh, I'll give some information on uh, the Karen people and Somali people, what it's like to communicate with people from another culture, what it's like to communicate with people who don't have any English ability. Um, I because we don't have the family information and we can't um, go through the you know the absolute specifics of days and times. Of when we're going to be doing the different appointments, our time um, might be a little bit less than two hours today. Uh, but I also tend to like to hear myself talk, so it's like just go for two hours. Two hours. Um, and I definitely don't have enough copies for everybody because I was anticipating like 15 people. I guess I should have communicated better and said how many people were on the team. Let's <laughs> 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 quite a few couples and we can share. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Well, yeah, let's pass this around. Um, these are just, um, there are two different handouts here. Our home supply list, which is the comprehensive list, and you may all have seen this already, the comprehensive list of the furniture and the household items that are required and some that are suggested. Um, we have to work within federal guidelines. So we have a, a checklist of items that we're required to provide. It's it's pretty small. <laughs> the, uh, like everybody needs their own bed, um, except in the incidences of married couples, they can share a bed, of course, and children of the same gender and similar ages can share a double bed. Um, and then we need a table and a chair for each person, uh, living room seating for everyone in the family plus one, a full table setting for everyone in the family plus one, a set of pots and pans, uh, it, you know, all the specific little items are there, but as far as furniture, only like a bookshelf or a dresser per family is required, which seems, seems a little silly. I have six children, there's no way I can live with one dresser. Yeah. <laughs> I think my boys would love it because they like piles anyways, so, but, but no way this model would be able to be okay with, with one dresser. 
So um, anything over and above is welcome. I mean, you have coffee tables and nightstands and extra lamps and um, art for the walls. That's really great. Anything that's going to make make the house feel very homey. I would say that for Karen families, uh, they like furniture that's movable. They really value space. Um, and please don't be offended if you see two months down the line that they've given away some of the furniture because they never had furniture. So they don't necessarily know what to do with it. They say, think, well, I could sit there on the ground. That table wasn't there. I'll give this table away so I can sit on the ground. Um, a lot of times they uh, sleep on the ground as well. So um, there may be times you could go to visit the family and see, oh gosh, that bed looks just like it did when I, when, I, when I first put it together and made it. That probably is because nobody slept in it. They tend to like to all sleep together in one room. Um, this is partly, you know, they, they, they've been living kind of in a bamboo hut in one room their whole life, so that's all they know. Um, we come into contact with our clients years down the road, and there's typically in like a three bedroom house, 12 or 13 people living in this three bedroom house because uh, they like to be together. Everything is very communal, we'd like it to be all together. So, um, yeah, anything you want to, if, if, we, if it's going to be a Karen or a Bhutanese or Nepalese family, we haven't been seeing a lot of Bhutanese and Nepalese lately, um, uh, but uh, if it's going to be a Bhutanese or Nepalese or, or Karen, uh, big rice cooker is important. They will eat rice every single day. Um, I did not bring that, I'll have to um, email you, I have a common Karen phrases, uh, and I'll email you guys that link so that everyone can have access to these common Karen phrases. And there's one, I, I don't know how to say it offhand in Karen, but it said, mean, have you had rice today? And it's basically the same thing as us saying, how's it going today? You having a good day? Because if you've eaten rice today, it's been a good day. So are you, is it the drug publications the one where you can listen to the phrases? If you um, want, send that to you. Go ahead and send that one because mine is just, just the, yeah, this, yeah. Okay. The, I have one, like, like, if it ends up being a friend family, we can, like, you can sit and listen and it, like, will play the phrases. So you can yeah. Actually learn. I'm still very hopeful that I, that we will match you with the Karen family. Uh, I love working with Karen family. Um, and they actually come in with a greater need than a lot of other families do. Um, Somali tend to have really good connections, uh, although that's not always, I mean, that's a pretty good generalization. But the Somali population is so big in Minneapolis and so well developed that there are a lot of, um, they kind of find their niche really easily. But for the Karen, it's more difficult. Um, a lot of the Somali are coming from South Africa, speak perfect English. So they don't need as great support, but the Karen typically have no English. Uh, who are coming in now. We're seeing the Karen uh, populations dwindling in the camps. Um, there's a, they have a new leader in Burma, and she is very interested in peace. And she's working very hard, harder than, and, and on a different path than we've seen before with previous leaders to create peace. But there's only a handful of Karen left in camps um, now. Uh, so we're kind of seeing the last bits, the, kind of the ones who are currently in the pipeline coming through. And they've been in camps for 25, 30 years. A very long time. Um, I met with a, a Karen family who was in a camp for 25 years. They're in a co-sponsorship right now. Um, and I met with them. I, I meet with the family after one month to say, see how they're doing so that they can see my face, so we can talk about um, the helper group. There is no word in Karen language for co-sponsor. <laughs> or even volunteer, so we use the word helper. Um, so I met, I met with this family uh, to see, you know, what are some things that you are wanting to work on. Uh, because after we get through the clinical work, the, all the appointments and making sure they're set up in all their services, we really want the family to leave. Uh, we want them to make as many decisions as they can. Uh, we do this for a couple reasons. Number one, we want them to learn to be self-sufficient. Um, that's really important. In this brief time that we have with them, we gotta, it's got to pack a bunch. So we need to work, do everything we can to encourage self-sufficiency, but also they never had choices to make in their life. Everything has been dictated to them. When they've been in a camp for 30 years, they're told where they're going to live, where they're going to wash their clothes, if their kids are going to go to school, what they're going to learn, what they're going to eat, when the food's going to come here. If there's electricity, there's no access to the switches. So they don't even get to decide when there's light and when there's not. So we want to give as many choices as we can. And that's really important to consider too when you're planning social activities, um, giving options. 
Anytime you can give options, let's give options. Do you want to go to Como Zoo today or do you want to go on a high school scene and have a fall? So, do you want to go to the library today or go practice shopping? Anytime you can give choices, let's give choices. But, um, okay. Oh, I met with his family. That's right. That's where I was going. Um, and I asked them, um, what's your favorite part of living in Minnesota so far? And I was thinking, I don't, I don't know what my expectations were with that question. It's, you know, kind of a very American question to ask. Kind of a very mom question to ask. Like, what's your favorite part of your day at school today? <laughs> <laughs> and so I asked them the question, you know, what's your favorite part of living here so far? And I guess maybe I was expecting, you know, seeing my family again, or, you know, not sleeping in the rain or something. And the mom said to me, uh, it's just so nice to not have to run for our life and to fear that we will die. And I just, it just, it cut me to the core. I kept it together in, in the house and throughout the rest of the visit, but I had a real good ugly cry in the car. Afterwards, just realizing that this is, that's the reality of these people, of refugees coming in, is that they have these lives that, they, it seems unreal. That how is it possible in this day and age that there are still people who have to be afraid for their lives, who have to run to, to stay alive, to keep their children alive, and then live in limbo in the camps for so long, and then do another hard thing and come here and learn a whole new language and a whole new community and a whole new weather system. You know, it's really overwhelming and it's so, I just love church involvement in refugee lives because this makes things easier for them. It provides this great foundation for them that they know, I don't know how to do this, but I know I have somebody who I can call. Uh, the way that the case managers are involved is very limited. And I wish it was greater, I wish it was more, but it's just the way resettlement is. It's kind of the way the federal government set it up, and it's the budget we have to work within. Um, the case managers do all the pre-arrival planning. If you guys weren't involved, yeah, they do all the pre-arrival planning, the apartment setups, airport arrival, all the, all the appointments. They get everything kind of all set up. There's a three-week cultural orientation called Jumpstart, and then there's a one-month visit and a 90-day visit. And that's kind of it. <laughs> They're there in case, you know, they, the case managers are there in case the family needs to call and say, I don't know what to do with this, or I got a medical bill. But generally, it's this limited involvement. Um, and so you guys really provide a really stable, concrete, wide net <laughs> for them so that they know they're not going to fall flat, they're not going to fail, they have this great support network to keep them moving forward. Melody, who is the case manager? Is there an act, one actual person with? We MCC? have we have three case managers right now, and okay. then several case aides. Okay, with um, MCC. Yes, okay. with MCC, we have a young woman named Katya, and she is our team coordinator. Uh, she does primarily. She's this little tiny blonde girl who speaks Somali, <laughs> so she primarily does uh, Somali cases, or she'll pick up cases when uh, other case managers have their case loads full. Uh, we have Adam, whose uh, current name is AKE, but everyone kind of said his grandmother named him Adam when he moved here, so that is his <laughs> name. Uh, and he, he does most of our current cases, and we have a new case manager, her name is Miriam Nur, and she is uh, she speaks both Somali and Arabic, so she'll be taking, I, she, she's still, I mean, I, I saw on, on the docket that she has a current case uh, in, her, in her docket, so Everybody kind of helps carry the load here. We have um, a current uh, case aide, his name is Boo Boo, and he is the sweetest, the most gentle soul I have ever met. Uh, we have another Somali case, case aide, his name is Mohammed Dahar, and he uh, he does a lot of other things in the office too, but he does a lot of support for um, Somali cases as well. We have employment specialists. Um, our employment team, team uh, Chibi Wankoff, is the team leader. He is uh, Nepalese, and he came here as a refugee, um, I want to say, seven years ago. It might have been a little bit longer than that. And then Brittany Kidma, who is just a good old little American girl, they handle, oh, and then we have Nathan Wig, who was our intern and he got hired on as uh, in part of our employment team. Um, uh, let me go ahead and describe kind of the government, the supports that the family could receive. Um, a family through our agency has a choice of MFIP, 
which is Minnesota Families in Progress. Is that right? Is that what you stand for? I always mix it up. Uh, but that's the general, that's the general welfare program. We also offer, offer a program called Match Grant, which is a tricky name because nothing's matched. <laughs> it just means there's greater support for a shorter amount of time. MFIP has smaller amounts for up to 60 months. Match Grant covers all of the rent, all of the utilities, plus the cash for six months. So that is a really good leg up for a lot of refugee families. MFIP won't cover rent, MFIP will cover utilities, until there's no sufficient match grant. Only a few of the agencies, resettlement agencies in the area have match grant at the S and um, International Institute in St. Paul. The rest are only work with MFIP. Now, if there's a single person or a married couple without children, they can receive RCA. That stands for Refugee Cash Assistance. And that's kind of the same thing as MFIP, just for smaller cases. Uh, and our, our, M, our, excuse me, our RCA coordinator, her name is Tarpa, and she is, uh, she's really neat. And I can't remember if she's been here as well. She's very quiet, so she doesn't share a lot of questions. Uh, so yeah, so those are the benefits that, that the family can sign up for and the different team members you can work with. Um, trying to think, if there's any, uh, Physical health or mental health issues that seem to be bigger than just a, a doctor visit uh, to take care of it, then we have a program called Intensive Case Management. And we have two health specialists, uh, Leah and Sarah, and they will come alongside and they will follow that case until the health issue is resolved or until there's an appropriate handoff of care. So usually pregnant women, uh, pregnant refugees who come in, uh, we follow them through other pregnancy and postpartum because they're at high risk for postpartum depression. Um, and giving birth here is very different than giving birth in, in Kenya or in Thailand. So we want to make sure that we walk through each step with them. They know how to access midwives or, or doulas. We have um, a nonprofit doula organization we work with, with some smaller speaking uh, doulas. The grant haven't used access to a lot of doulas yet, but they may in the future. Um, any sort of mental health issue, um, any sort of neurological disorder like uh, autism, uh, we will follow those cases long term until everything is kind of set up, they have services set up, and, and, and display that they can manage those themselves. So that's the team. Um, in addition to that, Laura Svoboda is my direct supervisor. She's our assistant director. She used to be the director at Arrive Ministries, um, which is um, another resettlement agency. It used to be World Relief, and they're on the, they're close to the airport. Um, and then Ben Whalen, uh, he he's done a lot of resettlement work overseas, and he was our interim director like eight years ago, and now he's back. And he's, uh, he got hired in February to be our new director. But you'll probably have no interaction with either of them. Unless I do a really bad job and you need to complain about me, which I won't. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope so. That's the plan at least. Okay, so um, do you guys feel like you have all your furniture collected? Feel good about it? Furniture? I know. It's the hard part, waiting to know specifics. Um, what is the plan for mattresses? Do you guys have mattresses or do you want? But we've got to clean a double of good and a lot of right now. Okay. And you can put the call up. One more that we're going to pick up. And we're going to be able to pick up. And we're going to be able to pick up. And we're going to be able to pick up. Okay. Now there are um, a couple families I'm waiting to hear back from the case managers to see what they feel like as far as matching them with the sponsors. Um, the way that we look at things, we kind of, um, when we initially get a family's information and we talk to their U.S. tie, that's somebody who they indicated they know here. It could be a family member, it could be a, a you know, a long distance family member, it could be a friend, or a lot of times it's an acquaintance, like it's somebody I knew went to grade school with before we went to the camps and they happen to know that they're here. <laughs> um, sometimes the family member, their U.S. tie, can provide a lot of support. Sometimes they're a refugee who's been here for five months themselves and they say I'm working 60 hours a week just to pay my bills. I can't help with anything. Uh, so I have to, it's those families who need, who, whose U.S. tie can't provide a lot of support that I like to match with those sponsors. Um, and I mean, that's typically everyone. 
<laughs> really typically, unless it's a family reunification case. Um, and we have had a lot of those lately. We have a lot of um, former Soviet Union families who are being reunified. Yeah, they're up in Anoka Ramsey area, um, but they their families are able to provide more support because they've been here a while and they have businesses and homes and vehicles and those families are off and running when they get here. Um, but yeah, so I have a couple families I'm looking at. One is a current family of three and mom's pregnant. Uh, so that's one that, that I'm looking at. They have no English um, and they have not gone past like elementary school. So it would be a more intense case. Um, the, the thing we run into with uh, cases where there is no English is that communication takes longer, which can be frustrating for the teens. Um, so I want to be really upfront with that, that I'm part time, I'm in 20 hours a week. In addition to co-sponsorship, I also manage individual volunteers, donations, outreach, and uh, communications, and I'm taking on the Refugee Speakers Bureau, or we train refugees to tell their stories, so they can come with me to presentations and share their story. Um, they're all really valuable, important programs, <laughs> but the funding keeps me at 20 hours a week. Uh, so yeah, so communication sometimes takes a little bit longer, and each case manager typically has at least 15 cases open at any one time. So it, I send an email or I walk over to talk to somebody, they have to look up something, it takes a little bit longer to, to get back to us. And if there isn't um, a family member, if the U.S. tie doesn't have any English ability, then we're looking at a little bit longer of a, a lag of communication of uh, the, you know, uh, somebody, uh, one of your leaders contacts me and says, hey, we want to take the family to the park this weekend. I say, all right, I'll have Adam give them a call. And they take them at them four times to get in touch with them. Uh, sometimes uh, refugees don't understand how to use their phones real well, so they uh, the ringer gets turned off and then it gets lost and we have to get a good phone. Or um, you know, they their phone dies and they can't find the charger or they run out of minutes, so it takes a little bit longer. So bear with me as I communicate and always know that I always am doing the best that I can <laughs> in communication. Yeah, so I have a question. I mean, my day job, I work at a at a public school, and we get recent refugees. That's yeah. I so, like, if if we get a family like this, should I try to operate within my like, colleague personal network, like their interpreters? Like, I mean, absolutely. At least maybe they'd be yes. willing to help with the phone call thing. I, I mean, I can't hear. Absolutely, the time you have the connections. Okay. Use them because, <laughs> because it sounds like on your end, you're yes. you don't have like. I wish I wish that we had the funding out. for like an ongoing subscription to the language bank right. for volunteers to use. That's just not in our funding right now. Um, you know, search in your hearts to see if maybe <laughs> it could be made in our in our funding available there. Um, but uh, yeah, for right now, yeah, if you have contacts, we yeah. just even ask. Mm -hmm. oh, and most people are happy to do that. And, um, and texting is, makes yeah. everything so easy. That's what I find a lot of teams do is they connect with the U.S. tie and text. Um, English is a lot easier for refugees to read because over the phone, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. It will take you a long time. It will take a good solid month to understand the, um, the accent uh, if, with somebody who has some sort of English. I have a lot of teams who tell me, oh, their English is so much better. And it's really not. They're just their ears are just used to the accent <laughs> after a month. <laughs> so yeah, anytime you can make connections, make the connections. I'll help connect you to libraries where I know they have Karen classes and they are there are frequently Karen speakers there. And it's easy to talk to any of the teachers and say, Hey, I'm helping this family. Can you interpret for us a little bit? Um, that happens quite often. Or if you go to the Dragon or any um, any Asian store, you can ask. Anybody who works there, hey, is there a foreign speaker, and they're usually happy to help as well. Uh, yeah, I've had teams have, have to do crazy things sometimes. Of, you know, oh, we went here, it was closed, and we needed to communicate with the family, so we went to two different stores to find a foreign speaker. And, yeah, so it's um, sometimes there's extra hoops to jump through with communication. But, um, okay, so you're feeling good about furniture, just waiting on the specifics for that. Okay. Oh, great. Great. That's wonderful to hear. Yeah, and if there's anything 
that you know is on our list of federally required items that didn't get donated or you guys could provide just let me know because we are required to make sure that they're there and we will make sure that they're there um, and so another thing i really want to emphasize is that we're a team so uh mcc and all of you we're all in this together it's not all on your shoulders so if there's anything that the team can't do we will make sure it gets done so if we are assigned to a family with a pregnant woman or mm -hmm. an infant, would you make sure you explain what kind of post sleeping arrangements or cribs or things sure. like that that we need because I yes. think there's different cultural mm -hmm. expectations. Any child under age two, we are federally required to provide a crib or packing place. So, but they are welcome to sleep however they want. But we have to make sure that that we provide, you know, just the safe. So then, mm -hmm. can you give us a look before you have out of town? Sure. We talked about where we're at, so we definitely need to visit the family. Yes, so their travel was deleted. Yes. Yep. Uh, and I'm really bummed about that because their sister is here, and she's much beloved in our office, and she was excited to act as the interpreter and to get to know all of you as well. So I, it was like a double, a double punch, double whammy there. Um, I, I touched on something else I really like to say is that. Um, when you meet a refugee family and you're working with a refugee family, you won't just meet them, you'll meet all of their extended family. And it, it's not uncommon for uh, for one, you know, one or two in the family to be like, oh, well, I'll just your interpreter and to join every single event going out and about because they just love to explore and love to be involved in it, love to practice their English. Once they kind of get over the worst part of getting a baseline of English, they love to practice. So there'll be extra family members in all the time. <laughs> You'll get to meet lots and lots of people. But where we're at, yeah, we're just waiting now. That's all we're doing is waiting for the for the right match. It could be anywhere from Oh no 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 no! That, for that family, that family it'll be yeah, yeah a couple months for them. But yeah, I'm I'm thinking a week or two, and we'll have that match solidified. I'm thinking this week we'll have a match solidified. Um, the the family I'm thinking of, the grand family of three with moms is pregnant. Um, they're arriving on the 28th. So I'm hoping that, that we will have that arrival and we'll have things solidified um, early this week. Yeah, every day I'm checking all of our arrival traffic. <laughs> this is the hardest part for me right now is like the hovering. I'm not a hovering thinker, I'm a doer. And so waiting and waiting and trying out for the right batch is, is challenging for me, growing for me. Always good. <laughs> So once we have the family locked down, um, our case manager will secure the apartment. Sometimes, some landlords only give us 48 hours before the family arrives. Um, we don't like to have huge amounts of time, like uh, we don't even like to have a full five days before the family arrives because they're paying for that those days and they're not there. And they need that money. That's like a hundred dollars or more that they need to have in their coffers to and to last and to, to survive. So typically it's going to be fast for a new apartment set up. I always like it when it works out that we can get the keys on a Friday and they arrive on a Monday. That's always great. We are seeing now that we're developing good enough relationships with landlords and they're having good enough uh, experiences with co-sponsors that they're excited and they're like, yeah, you can have it a couple extra days. Because they know you guys come in and our the teams come in and clean, <laughs> and so they they're always up for every cleaning. <laughs> and on that, I'll talk about the apartments a little bit. Um, they're always going to be in poor neighborhoods because it needs to be affordable rent. Um, they are always going to be safe uh, neighborhoods because we're putting families with children there. And we're sending our case managers there. So we don't want to send in any of our team or send a family with children anywhere where it's going to be unsafe. Uh, an example of this is we have a, um, a Somali family. It was a Somali family of nine. And they had a co-sponsor, Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Minneapolis. And they were placed in northern Minneapolis. And it's one an area that we hadn't really explored yet, uh, like far north Minneapolis, kind of a borderline neighborhood. But for a family that size, it was the housing that was available, and we had no options. It's just this is the only place available. It has turned out to be very unsafe, and so we're in the process of helping that family move now. Their nine-year-old daughter was assaulted by a teenage girl in the neighborhood who was yelling slurs about her being Somali and about her being Muslim. And so these type of things happen, 
but we do work really hard to keep everyone in neighborhoods that we would feel comfortable being in. That being said, um, they're not always in the best of condition. There's a variety of smells going on in most of the apartments. Uh, if you have an issue with smells, I would bring you know a little lavender to put down on your lip, <laughs> or a mask you can put some lavender or whatever smell you like, because there's usually like five different curries going on, plus a lot of other long, you know, long-lived smells in hallways and things. So it's um, yeah, it's going to be a real learning experience for all the senses. <laughs> the apartments. Uh, typically, they're in buildings where there aren't elevators. So if it's a second or third floor apartment, everything can be hauled up, all the stairs. So make sure you get every teenage boy uh, you on summer break there to haul furniture upstairs. Let's hope it's after the mission trip. Yeah. 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 Get them all. Yeah. If you have access to football teams, get those football teams. <laughs> There for moving. Um, the apartments are given a basic cleaning, but not a deep cleaning by more apartments. Uh, there's a lot left to be desired in their cleaning skills. Most of the refugees don't notice. They've been living in, you know, tents or huts with dirt floors, so they don't really notice that. Oh gosh, these it doesn't look like these baseboards have ever been wiped, or it doesn't look like they took a mop to this floor. Um, sometimes the, we, we work really hard to make sure that there are not units that have a urine smell. And sometimes the bathrooms do have a little bit of a urine smell. Um, and they're usually small. So if huge pieces of furniture have been donated, those probably won't fit. And the huge entertainment centers and things that probably won't fit. <laughs> or oversized couches. Yeah, the apartments are generally pretty small. Oh. And who settled yeah, correct. Yeah. And families in uh, mostly in a specific area? They're usually in uh, East St. Paul. East side. Yeah, East uh, side, yeah. Okay. Yeah, some in Roseville. Yeah. And then along along Maryland into yeah. into yeah. the north through the north end. So there's like if you take if you take Wheelock Parkway in Maryland, yeah. yeah. So like there's we have this tons of all the way all the way, all the way to the east side of them, and then like east side of kind of like the whole east side. There's some like the 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 yeah. Occasionally, that's where we find houses is in Roseville, but generally the, everyone. It's kind of together yeah. Yeah. Yes. And when you're moving in, um, if you see neighbors out and about, make efforts to meet the neighbors. There will probably be current speakers in the building, um, or if you're we're in, you know, northern Minneapolis, the safer part of northern Minneapolis with the Somali family, make efforts to meet neighbors because there'll be Somali speakers who also speak English, and neighbors are going to be uh, a really great resource for you uh, for uh, communication. And also in finding where a whole, you know, uh, the best halal meat, uh, you know, the best store to get halal meat, or the best store for, you know, whatever the, the current family wants. They, a lot of times, like young roosters and young hens, and not every store has a, a you know, affordable price for them. So neighbors are going to be a really good resource. So do you hear that money until they, uh, until they have jobs? Uh, they receive, they are eligible for time limited public benefits. So they, uh, but those don't usually kick in until about the month, one month mark. So they, uh, from that $925 per person, um, I mentioned that earlier this morning. Did I mention that in here? No. Okay. no. <laughs> Sorry. No. No. Lending my presentations here. Um, every refugee receives a one time grant of $925 per person, and that's supposed to last until they're self sufficient. Um, I often think, thank God that's not just what my parents did. So when I graduated high school, there's not even $25. Good luck. You yeah. so <laughs> have to expect Do they get money for the baby to be? No. No, they don't. Yeah, they have to be born. Yeah, so newborn through, you know, whatever, age 100, 110. Uh, $925 per person. For a larger family, that works out okay. I mean, that's going to be, you know, for a family of eight, that's, that's a lot of money that's going to last them a long time. That's partly because rent is really stable in Minneapolis. Um, it doesn't, and, and St. Paul, it, for each bedroom added on, it doesn't go up, the rent doesn't go up exponentially. So rent is really stable here. So larger families, it, it's, it, that's an okay amount, but for a family of three, that's going to be eaten up really quickly. Um, that's one reason why providing their furniture and mattresses is so important, because normally that money gets taken out. The new mattresses, 
take care of that nine hundred twenty five dollars per person. That's a lot of money. <laughs> I don't want to buy all of my kids new mattresses. That's just too much. <laughs> Do they have to have new mattresses or can they be used? Um, we go back and forth on that in our office because bed bugs have have been a problem in in St. Paul. So everyone's very afraid of bed bugs. Um, so yeah. Yes. <laughs> I am going to say that as long as you feel like you would sleep on them, then yes, let's do it. But we can go we can go forward with that. Yeah. And use toddler beds and crib mattresses or um, I you know if there rips happen, you know, there's plastic covers on, on crib mattresses, but that just pick them up and make sure they're as long as you would put your child on it, then yes. But that's that's always kind of my standard for the new is that if you if you would use it yourself, or if you would give it to a neighbor and have them use it, then it's it's going to be good enough for the rest of the family. What what advice do you have for us if if we see a, a financial need okay. that they can't really address? Um, we haven't encountered that yet. Yeah. Yes, it is good. Yeah, and there are uh, there are co-sponsorship programs like um, Lutheran Social Services. They require a uh, $4,000 commitment that goes into rent, um, rent assistance, but we've we've seen that this is still a successful model without that sort of, this, sort of assistance because self-sufficiency is our primary goal. We want to see each family able to maintain their lives on their own within our our, our time frame with them. Um, yeah, we haven't seen, there really isn't anything that's going to be so outstanding that it needs to be met immediately. If there is, then we definitely would bring it to the church. <laughs> we you would bring it to us. I would, yes. Yeah. Yes. And say, hey, we're finding that they need XYZ. Like sometimes, uh, I mean, if there's a medical, you know, anything medical they need, the insurance is going to cover it. Mm -hmm. um, there should be, they don't need a vehicle for a very long time. That's an expense that they won't be able to manage for a very long time. Um, and they're really, yeah, we haven't found any big financial needs as of yet. 